Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar on Tips and Tools for Engendering Your Mission, CDCS. I'm Amy Contra, Communications Specialist for the Gender Development Office at USAID, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Throughout the presentation, you can submit questions to our presenters during the chat panel. We'll be collecting these questions and addressing them during the Q&A session at the end. I'd like to now present Kathy Cazzarelli, Senior Gender Advisor of the Bureau for Policy, Planning, and Learning at USAID. Welcome, Kathy. Thanks, Amy. Super happy to be here. And thanks, everybody, for hopping online this morning. Hope, well, I guess probably it's afternoon where most of you are, but hope you're having a smooth day. We are going to spend probably 30 to 35 minutes or so walking through this webinar on engendering your CDCS. And we'll leave plenty of time uh, for questions after that. So what are the goals of the webinar today? We've got a couple of things in mind that we'd like to accomplish. First, to review the requirements for gender integration in CDCSs, and these are spelled out in ADS 205. We'll walk through these step by step. Secondly, to do a super brief review of how to do a gender analysis for your CDCS. And there are a lot of other resources that can help you with this, and I'll mention a couple of those as well. And then we're going to look at some evidence related to how we're doing as an agency in terms of integrating gender and CDCSs. I'll tell you a little bit about the assessment of the gender policy that's underway now. And we have a couple of early results from that that can inform our conversation today. And then finally, we'll introduce a new tool that you can use to track whether you're meeting the gender integration requirements at the mission as you work on your CDCS. And that'll be hopefully a helpful takeaway from today's webinar for you. So let's talk about ADS 205. Hopefully, you all know it word for word, but I'll review it just in case you don't. This was released in 2013 as a companion to our gender policy. And the purpose of ADS 205 was really to operationalize all of the key mandates of the uh, policy itself. But the policy simply spelled out in sort of high-level terms what we should be doing. ADS 205 really explains it in much more operational and concrete detail. We also, in ADS 205, wanted to really focus on explaining what everyone's role should be. The brunt of the work for gender analysis and other gender activities should not fall on the gender advisor alone. But others of you in program offices, technical offices, and other places also have a role to play. ADS 205 also, <clears throat> for the first time at USAID, gave some very detailed guidance about how to do a gender analysis and what we mean by a gender analysis in our agency. And that's really where we're going to be focusing today. So as the top of this slide shows, gender analysis is mandatory for CDCSs and also for project designs. Not on the slide, but I do want to mention that it's also uh, required to do a gender analysis at the activity level if you find that your pad gender analysis is too high level and doesn't give you enough detail in order to really inform activity design and then an eventual solicitation. So once we have our gender analysis, we incorporate those findings into CDCSs and project designs. That should naturally flow into your solicitations. And ADS 205 has tons of detail about the questions you can ask yourself to make sure that your solicitations are being engendered. Then we also hope to engender our monitoring, evaluation, and learning plans and our OPs and PPRs. Some of the indicators that are reflected in those may also come from the gender analyses, but some of them will also come from additional and further planning. Just a quick note, most of you, maybe all of you, I'm sure, are aware that ADS 200 and 201 are being updated uh, as we speak. And uh, should be ready in a couple of months. We don't anticipate any major changes in the gender requirements, in case you were wondering about that. Um, there may be a few changes, uh, small changes here and there. We plan to uh, lightly tweak ADS 205 after 201 has been cleared and released, just to make sure that everything is totally harmonized. So what is gender analysis? Gender analysis is not rocket science. A lot of people seem to be sort of worried, I would say, that it's something super complicated and that they don't know how to do it and that they're going to have struggle to do it. It's really just an analytical method, an analytical tool. And what we're doing is just asking the right kinds of questions to let us uncover key gender issues that we need to know about. So we use this tool to identify and understand gaps between males and females 
and the relevance of gender norms and power relations in your specific context. It's really just a method of inquiry shaped by a frame of questions that, if you ask, can help get you the answers or at least to understand what you should be um, finding out about in order to engender your CDCS in this case. So the kinds of things that we look at are the different roles and rights of men and women as well as the relationships between them. Um, we look for gender inequalities but not just for the inequalities themselves, but also to understand what their root causes are. We look at the different needs that men and women have, what things constrain them, and these are often different also, but also what are the opportunities uh, for people of both sexes. We also look to determine um, how we can close whatever gender gaps or inequalities we have uncovered. So this is one of the key points. We don't want to just understand what the uh, gender issues are and what the gender inequalities are in a particular context. We want to come up with some good ideas about uh, windows of opportunity and places where we can intervene and try to address those gaps or constraints. And then finally, we want to look for potential adverse impacts or gender-based exclusion when you get to the project level. And what we mean by that is, is there something about the way you've designed your project that might inadvertently generate a negative effect that we don't want to see or that we didn't anticipate? Just to give you an example of this, in some cases, uh, sometimes people find that projects that empower women economically might unintentionally also lead to an increase in gender-based violence when people in the family uh, are not used to the changing power dynamics that come along with that. This is probably the hardest thing, I think, about a gender analysis. It's difficult to think about what we don't expect, what that could look like, uh, but it's important to try to think this through. So let's talk about the USAID approach um, to gender analysis. And at the top here, it says that no one gender analysis framework has been adopted as the standard approach. Let me, I want to just clarify that a little bit because when I was reading over my notes last night, I was thinking this could sound confusing to people because we do have a, an, a type of approach we want that uh, you to use. But what we mean by this is that if you look into the academic literature, there are tons of gender analysis frameworks that have been put forward by psychologists, sociologists, economists, many, many others. There, they're very complicated. They often are pitched at different scenarios, sometimes uh, directly uh, aiming towards countries in conflict. They focus on different kinds of things. We haven't, as an agency, adopted a particular academic approach, but we have adopted a way of thinking about this and a framework for asking questions. And I do want to say that those questions are the, at the heart of what most gender analysis frameworks look for. So our method is in step with what others are doing. So the first thing to mention <clears throat> is that we need to all collect descriptive statistics on the status of males and females, hopefully disaggregated by other demographic variables. And what I mean by that is that there are, men and women are not just monolithic categories of people. So there's all different subgroups of females and males, and those subgroups may experience very different realities. There may be intersecting characteristics that describe them that inform the difficulties and the opportunities that they face. There are many, many, many sources of descriptive statistics. There are more of them coming online all the time. And I think with the Sustainable Development Goal process underway now, we're going to have a lot of emphasis on gathering statistics and disaggregated statistics. So I think we'll see more and more opportunities to get the kinds of statistics um, that we need. So to the extent possible, we ask that people use the domains framework. This is what we call it, listed in the ADS, when they do their gender analysis. So what's that mean exactly? What are domains? These are the five domains that are described in the ADS and that we use. And what we mean by domains is simply that these are the broad areas that you should use to structure your gender analysis questions. So the reason for that is these five things here basically are the main areas in which you will typically find that there are key differences between men and women or key inequalities. So these can be used to frame the sorts of things that you look for. So just super briefly, because there are a lot of places you can get more detailed understanding of this, what do these things mean? So the first one, laws, policies, regulations, and institutional practices, this basically refers to the formal and informal 
uh, legal systems in countries, so including customary law. So what we want to do here is look at questions like, how are women and men treated in legislation in this country? So are there equal opportunity laws? Is there a gender equality law? Is there a GBV law, for example? These are the kinds of questions um, that we might look at. What happens with the judiciary? Uh, how does that treat men and women? Are there customary systems that are in conflict <clears throat> with the, the technical legal system in the country that might disadvantage women? So those are the kinds of things we're looking for there. The second one, access to and control over assets and resources, this is really a key feature. Women in many places have much less control over key assets. This can be land, employment, uh, access to financial credits, employment, access to social services. And even in some cases where they have access to some of these resources, they don't have control over them. So what we want to know, usually in a CDCS, is exactly where do we see the main asset gaps, particularly in the areas where we plan to do our programming, and are there certain things that we can do to try to close those gaps? In many places where USAID works, we're doing work on land, increasing women's access to land, uh, and employment, among other things. The third one of these gender roles, responsibilities, and time use, this basically refers to pretty much what it sounds like. What are the socially prescribed roles for men and women? How are they supposed to behave? How are they supposed to spend their time? What are their responsibilities? And how does that impact them and whether they can in and participate in our projects, for example? This is also a very key thing when you're looking at women's opportunities. Women typically have a lot of responsibilities for care work in the home, whether they have formal or informal jobs. So we've all heard of the double burden that women face. Uh, so this has a heavy impact on their time and how they can use their time and whether they have enough time to participate in our projects. This also means once you get to project design, you have to think about where women are and what they can do with their time and what their time constraints are, uh, rather than just assuming that they can participate in something, even if we've designed it to benefit women. The fourth one of these cultural norms and beliefs, this is pretty much what a lot of people refer to as gender stereotypes. And what we're looking for here is basically what are the stereotypes that shape gender identities and norms in the countries in which we work. And then do these stereotypes function as facilitators or barriers to men and women in their lives and in terms of participating in our projects? There are definitely gender stereotypes everywhere in every country. Uh, and I think if you, in my experience from doing gender analyses, if you go out and talk to people in your country, it's very easy for them to identify for you what the cultural norms and beliefs are. And in many cases, they'll be able to easily tell you what the constraints are for men and women uh, because of those. And I do want to emphasize what I just said, which is men and women. We're talking about women for the most part, but gender norms and cultural beliefs about men and masculinities and how men should behave also constrain men's opportunities. And uh, these, this is something also we need to take into account. Then patterns of power and decision making, the last one here. This is basically about who has the ability to, to decide things, to influence things, to exercise control. And we're talking about this at multiple levels, in the household, in the community, nationally. Uh, will women have control over and benefit from assets, for example, they might accrue as a result of participating in our activities? We also, when we're talking about power and decision making, are talking about access to um, ability to run, for, to run for office, for example, to participate in political processes. So power and decision making also at the country level. There are a couple of things I want to say about this um, gender analysis domains model, which is, I think, in talking to people when they're trying to do gender analyses in countries, sometimes we get a little too hung up on whether we are strictly applying all of these domains. So I want to say that most important thing is not that you can tick the box of all of these domains and say, OK, we've got information about each of these. These are meant to frame the kinds of questions you ask. Maybe you live in a country where one of these will end up not being relevant. Um, not too many countries like that, but you never know. So don't worry so much about that. And the other thing is don't worry about the fact that in some cases, the questions you ask and the things you find out 
can overlap in these domains. They are not stovepipes, especially patterns of power and decision making. Issues of power tend to cross cut all of these other domains, for example. So sometimes you'll find when you're asking questions about one domain that you're getting information that's relevant um, to one of the others. So that's really OK, not to worry. Also, you may have some issues that you want to cover that cross cut the domains, and that's fine. One example of this might be gender-based violence, for example. Um, when I used to do gender analyses for CDCS and CDCS's for missions in the ENE region, I would do a separate section in those analyses on GBV, just because it was such an important issue. You can get at GBV easily within the domains as well. So under laws, policies, regulations, for example, um, you could look at whether there's a gender-based violence law or not. But sometimes if you want to write, write a lot about a topic uh, that cross-cuts, it's easier just to, to have it uh, separately. There are a ton of sector-specific uh, resources available on gender analysis when you get to the project level. I can help point you to some. Your regional bureau gender advisor can help point you to some. GenDev has a whole collection of these, too. Um, there is one in particular that I'd like to recommend because I worked on it. <laughs> and this is the e, e Bureau put out a gender analysis toolkit a couple of years ago. And it basically goes through the domains and provides lists of illustrative questions for 16 different sectors that you can ask when you're doing your gender analysis. So just to let you know, there is help out there to get you jump started on asking questions within these domains. I know sometimes uh, people find that difficult. So how does gender analysis uh, differ at CDCS and project levels? So just to say the bottom point first here, which is that we use the domains framework in both cases. So we're using the same model of the questions that we ask, but the, the level of focus is really different. So at the CDCS level, we should be identifying basically macro or big picture sector level uh, societal gender inequalities or obstacles to female empowerment. And really importantly, you know, we don't all have a ton of time. We realize this. Everybody is pressed. What you really want to focus your gender analysis for a CDCS is at the uh, DOs and IRs where the mission plans to work. So this is something I think that um, should be intuitive, but I think it is worth saying. So if you're not, for example, planning to do any health programming under a CDCS, it doesn't really make sense to spend a lot of time talking about gender disparities in health when you do your gender analysis. So uh, there may be a case where a mission isn't quite sure what the DOs or IRs will be, in which case you want to go broader. But generally speaking, big picture, 30,000 foot level, look for gender inequalities and obstacles to female empowerment in the areas where the mission plans to work with under the DOs and the IRs. So once you get to project level gender analyses, this is a, uh, a time to dig deeper and identify gender inequalities in the specific area that will be covered by the project. And in many cases, a good gender analysis at the CDCS level will provide a lot of information that is relevant to the eventual projects that are planned and designed under that uh, CDCS. But usually there, it's not a deep enough dive. The point of the later project gender analysis is to really get in the weeds in the particular sector in which you're working. I do want to mention that at the moment, USAID does not have a standard template to help people do gender analysis at the CDCS level or the project level. There is a how-to note on gender integration and project design. We are back in Washington right now talking about um, collaborating, PPL and GenDev, and likely some others as well, on a draft template to use for gender analysis because we've gotten a lot of requests from missions to supply um, something along those lines to help people out. Missions themselves have come up with a lot of their own tools uh, in many cases, and we will likely loop in some of those and build up with some of those as well. So once the ADS revisions have been completed, we're going to turn to trying to come up with some of these templates and some other tools that will help missions uh, with these CDCS processes. So when you're doing your gender analysis at the CDCS level, who should you be consulting with? Uh, there are lots of people in country who tend to have a lot of expertise in gender, and they're spread all across the board. So representatives from national, local, or community governments, most countries have a gender ministry or a ministry for women and children or some equivalent. 
There are often in parliaments are specific women's caucuses or bodies that work on women's issues. There may be a gender ministry, point people. All of these people are very useful to talk to because they typically have a great 30,000 foot picture of what the key gender issues are in the country. Similarly, staff from international donor and development organizations also have expertise. I always would, when I do these, did these analyses, would talk to UNDP, uh, the World Bank, other big picture donors if they're in the country. Local gender experts, civil society organizations, tons of expertise, specifically women's organizations. I've found generally very knowledgeable, especially about issues like gender-based violence, uh, some times also on issues related to economic empowerment and other things like that. But don't forget there are also academics and researchers in countries, journalists, other people that can provide you nuanced and interesting information uh, about what you're looking for. So our implementing partners also, they've been working in countries. Uh, they often can provide us with particular insights and expertise. And then don't forget your potential beneficiaries. Talk to the men and women in the country. Look for diverse groups of them. Uh, they understand what their constraints are much better than we do in many cases. And don't forget when you do this that you might have to sometimes set up um, specific situations that where women feel OK to speak and to tell you about uh, the barriers that they face. Sometimes if you put men and women together in a group, a focus group, for example, what you find is that the presence of the men there will constrain women and they won't feel open to speak to you. So just bear in mind that you might need to seek to create the conditions that will allow everybody to talk in an open and productive manner. OK, let's talk about once you've done your gender analysis, what happens and uh, what does one do with it? So once the gender analysis is done, the point is not just to do it, clearly, but to use it to engender the CDCS. We want the CDCS to reflect, basically, the gender results that you found. So what I'm going to present here is basically what the CDCS says in terms of um, what an engendered CDCS looks like, so, or what the ADS says, what an engendered CDCS looks like. So what are the key features? Uh, let me just say before I start that uh, our advice is to try to complete this analysis as early as possible in phase two. Uh, the the um, revised 201 will require all analyses to be complete by the end of phase two. But since we want you ideally to use the gender analysis to inform the way you design and write and think about your CDCS, we hope that you'll consider getting it done as early as possible. So the gender analysis findings should inform and be incorporated into all sections of the CDCS. So basically mainstreamed throughout the document. The narrative must discuss explicitly how the country strategy will contribute to the three outcomes of the gender equality and female empowerment policy. And just brief, briefly, those are to reduce gaps between men and women in access to resources of various types. That's a gender equality outcome, reductions in gender-based violence. And then the third, uh, reductions in constraints that prevent men and women from leading, participating fully in, and influencing their society. So that's female empowerment. Those are the three. Um, big picture uh, outcomes that we want to target. So the background narrative section in your CDCS should include a description of the key gender gaps and sex disaggregated statistics to support the articulation of those gaps. And then it's not sufficient, I want to say, for documents to represent gender as a cross-cutting issue described in a separate single paragraph or section somewhere in the text of a CDCS. Uh, I, I do want to point out that we very rarely see this happen anymore, but in the old days, you used to often read a CDCS and there'd be a box somewhere with a square around it that said gender, and there'd be a paragraph about gender, and the rest of the CDCS um, would be gender blind. So did this just skip? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to go back here, because that jumped ahead of me. OK. So we, when we're saying it shouldn't be represented as a single section or paragraph, it's fine to say it's a cross-cutting issue as long as you treat it as a cross-cutting issue and cross-cut it through the document. It's not OK just to have it set off in a single uh, standalone box. Final point here is we want the DOIR text to explicitly identify the gender gaps, but also how they're going to be addressed under the CDCS. So it's not enough to just say, these are the gaps, here are the disadvantages that women face. 
the point should also be to articulate at least broadly how USAID is going to tackle those under the CDCS. Maybe my. All right, let's see. CDCS is a couple of more points. Um, the M&E framework should include gender sensitive indicators, including the F standard indicators. Hopefully you all know what the F standard indicators are. These are undergoing review right now, and uh, we're almost done. I've been working uh, with leading the team on this, and it's very likely that in the future, two of the gender indicators that we've had for the last few years will be dropped. This is the self-efficacy one, and the one that measures whether GBV is viewed as less acceptable after uh, people are exposed to USG-supported programming. We're proposing to drop those just because really very few missions have ever used them. And we're probably going to add a new indicator on supporting capacity building uh, in public or private institutions for people to work on gender equality issues. So you can include a standalone gender DO if you would like, but this is optional. If you do such if you do so, you should explain how it achieves gender equality or female empowerment goals as part of your overall development hypothesis. So link it in to the broad development hypothesis of the strategy. Um, DO teams should consult with a wide variety of key stakeholders, including intended beneficiaries. I just talked about that on the last slide. And then technical teams and program staff must be substantially involved in the gender analysis process. This is something that we really tried to add in um, the ADS, and that was a bit of a departure from how business as usual was being conducted uh, at the time. So in other words, we really ideally do not want missions to just contract out the gender analyses and to have nobody at the mission with some actual experience or buy-in um, with that analysis. So as much as possible, the gender advisor or someone else from a technical team <clears throat> should be involved, hopefully from the beginning, um, in the analysis. And that will engender, to use that word again, more mission buy-in, hopefully uh, down the line. Talk some about how we're doing. And we've had some analyt an anecdotal evidence based on CDCS reviews over the last few years that we're doing better. I myself have read probably 20 CDCSs by now, I would say. And I, I would say, based on my experience, I've clearly seen an increase in the gender integration in those as we've moved um, across time. So, But we wanted to have some more concrete evidence than just basically anecdotal. So you may hopefully know that we are right now doing an assessment of USAID's gender policy. And hopefully you all filled out the survey that came as part of that. Uh, and another piece of that assessment involves looking at gender integration in a sample of CDCSs. So that's one piece of this. I do want to say that we're going to put together all of the pieces of gender assessment that we've been doing. And we should be issuing an internal report sometime probably roughly in the middle of the summer or perhaps by the end of the summer at the latest. So bear in mind that what I'm going to say here is draft results, but uh, in a couple of months you'll hear the final results as well. So in order to look at gender integration in CDCSs, we developed a scoring template for CDCSs, and we based this on uh, what we saw in the ADS as the requirements. So this template basically listed each of the ADS requirements and our scores scored CDCSs on a 1 to 3 or 1 to 4 scale in terms of the extent to which they integrated gender according to that criterion. We did a random sample of 30 CDCSs. A bunch of those were from before the policy was released, and a number of those came after the policy is released. So what did we find here? First of all, I want to say, not surprisingly, most likely, that we found wide variations across CDCSs. So there were a few that scored high on all of the questions on our template. Unfortunately, some that scored low on all of the questions, but the vast majority fall somewhere in between there. 77% of the CDCSs had a strong gender integration score on at least one of the questions on our template. But there was no single question where, on average, all CDCSs were scored as strong. So there's a lot of variation out there, uh, but clearly some key strengths in the CDCSs that we looked at. On average, integration in some sections of the CDCS was stronger than integration in some of the other sections. Uh, for example, 
the questions that looked at gender integration in the results framework narrative, and we had three of those, I think, those received the highest score of anything um, that we looked at. So people are doing a good job, basically, of integrating gender in the results framework. Uh, similarly, in the background narrative, CDCS has did a good job of identifying gender gaps. And as I said, that's one of the key things we want to do with our gender analysis. But then they were less strong in terms of presenting sex disaggregated data or other supportive elements about gender norms or female leadership or power. So essentially, we often saw in these CDCSs that there were gaps that were identified but then there wasn't a whole lot of supporting out of evidence to explain them. So we had a somewhat incomplete understanding of the root causes and challenges or dynamics uh, underlying those. You'll notice on the slide, um, it says better than others and then evaluation section. Broadly speaking, we found the evaluation sections of the CDCSs to be the least gender integrated. This was particularly true with the section where uh, we ask that uh, missions include some kind of gender sensitive evaluation question in the evaluation section. They were better in terms of including uh, ME indicators than they were evaluation questions. So in terms of uh, a little more information about that, a couple of other things that we found. Generally speaking, if you look at the individual questions in our template, they, the average score across all of the CDCSs was somewhere in between limited gender integration and moderate gender integration. So not strong, but still at least moderate in many cases. Uh, one point that made us super happy, the second bullet uh, that you can see on your screen, is that CDCSs that were produced after the gender policy was issued scored higher on almost all of the measures of gender integration than those that were produced before the policy. This is something that we were really crossing our fingers and hoping to see, and we were super happy um, to, to see it. And a couple more details on that point. If you look at CDCSs that were released in 2013 to 2015, so after the policy, and you compare those to those that were released in 2011 or 2012, you find that uh, the newer ones have, a, have fewer uh, CDCSs with zero scores. So in other words, there are fewer of these that are purely gender blind. We had a higher percentage that had strong gender integration scores, so there's more of them that have done better. And the average scores on six out of the 10 questions that measured the extent of gender integration moved from the limited to the moderate range. So all really um, strong and good findings. We also looked at, just out of curiosity, we broke out the CDCSs for each of those years, 2011 through 2015. And what we found was a clear uptick uh, from each year to the next year in terms of the extent of gender integration. So that's also really good news. So a final question that we asked on this template was, is this CDCS a good example of gender integration? And we asked whether uh, it was in whole or in part. We found uh, that our scores scored 26% of the sample of CDCSs as not providing a good example of gender integration in any section. So that's about a quarter of them. 13% were said to have provided good examples in all sections, which is awesome. And the rest were somewhere in between. So roughly 60% uh, of them had at least some sections we could point to and say, uh, this is a good example of gender integration. Uh, process issues. This is something, I, I threw a question out there. Uh, on the invite, which nobody answered, sadly. But we were trying to get a little bit at process issues. So uh, let's, uh, a couple of things here, points to make, which is that it's hard to have a gender sensitive CDCS without a strong gender analysis. But having a strong gender, gender analysis just doesn't guarantee a gender sensitive CDCS. You have to weave the findings into the document itself. And uh, our analysis of the CDCS has showed that this is really pretty uneven. But we here in DC don't have a good window onto what goes on in the field. What happens that by which the findings from the gender analysis are or are not being translated into the CDCS itself? This is something that we would really like to hear more from you about. So to go on to the next page, uh, in terms of good practices or examples, as I mentioned, there are uh, a a number of CDCSs that can be seen as strong examples. I was in Rwanda recently, so I want to give them a shout out. I thought their 
uh, CDCS was super strong in terms of gender integration. It has a really, uh, does a really thorough job integrating gender across the document. And you can find it on ProgramNet if you'd like to look at that example of how to do this well. Um, the question I had asked in the invite, you know, how did you use your gender analysis to inform your CDCS? What made that work? Give us some examples of good practices. As I mentioned, no one answered that. I don't think that means there are no good practices out there. So we're still interested in this. Uh, send me an email at any point if you'd like to let me know um, how you did it and did it well. I just want to briefly show some tools that we have to help you engender your CDCSs. We have two online courses, Gender 102 and Gender 103. These go into gender analysis in CDCS and what an engendered CDCS should look like in quite a lot of detail. Not very many of you have taken these courses, and a lot of people don't even remember they're out there, I think. So just want to remind you that those resources are available. You can always go back and refer to ADS 205, which is quite detailed, and then basically, we have uh, taken the tool that we use to score the CDCSs that I was just describing to you, and we've turned it into a tool that you can use at missions to track how well you are or are not um, integrating gender in your CDCS. So this tool is based on the criteria laid out in ADS 205, so it maps almost completely onto that. It's an easy format. We took out our rating scales, the 1 to 3 or the 1 to 4, because we didn't think that you'd want to get into that level of the weeds. And we wanted to basically give you a tool that you could use while you're working on your CDCS to see if you're engendering it as you should, but also to let you know when we review CDCSs in Washington, these are the kinds of things we look for, so that it's not a surprise to you when people come back with comments that map onto the kinds of things in the template. So the next slide gives you a snapshot of the template itself. And the full document is attached in the resources module, or pod, whatever it's called, uh, that you see on your screen so that you can download it. And you'll see here the left-hand column of the uh, checklist shows the criteria that we're using, basically. And uh, if you want, you can just look at that. Just look at those criteria and then look at your CDCS and see if they map. Uh, we have a box in the middle for comments. So if you're reviewing your mission CDCS and you want to make a comment, oh, this was not really integrated enough or in this section, you can write there. If you have a recommendation, you can do that. And then significant issue or concern, it's totally up to you whether you use that. This maps onto the way we are asked in Washington to provide feedback about CDCSs. So this will also show you the way that we're going to be looking at this. But as I said, if all you want to do is look at column one and make a judgment whether you think that you've tackled these in your CDCS, that really should suffice. OK, the final page here, just really wanted to say uh, very briefly, happy to answer any of your questions. Hopefully, we'll have time to get to all of them. You can always contact me later. That's my email address right there. We're really interested in getting examples of good practices here in DC around CDCSs. Did you use any templates? What was your process? How did you engender your CDCS? So feel free to send us your, your good ideas and your good examples at any point. OK, that ends the official presentation. Looks like we've got a bunch of questions here. Um, Comments or questions? Let's see. We have a comment from Mahmouda that descriptive statistics no one collects. We can't measure what gaps we are reducing um, through our intervention. I'm not completely sure what that means. But basically speaking, measuring the gaps that you're reducing through your intervention should come about by uh, having our implementing partners collecting gender sensitive data and statistics. So this would mean that. Those have to be designed off in custom indicators or to supplement the standard uh, F indicators in order to get at what's happening in your project. Um, Mahmouda also says, how can we ensure doing a gender analysis by involving men and women on the ground? Um, we, you know, this, there are lots of different ways that you can do this. When I did these um, in the E&E region, we would sometimes get our implementing partners to gather up um, groups of men and women to participate and to come in and talk to us in roundtable formats. 
we would go out sometimes into the field uh, and to the sites where our projects were being implemented and uh, talk to people on the ground there. It can be, you know, as I said, in places particularly where women are not used to, to talking to people they don't know very well, you might have to set up some special circumstances. Uh, implementing partners hosting these conversations, for example, can also be a little easier to navigate than if it's seen as USAID per se hosting. Okay, this uh, next question from Sarah Cooper with respect to the literature review, are there specific topics or key questions that should be addressed? Something akin to the gender analysis domains. Essentially, the, gen the point of the domains is to help you frame questions that should then be what you address in your actual uh, gender analysis as it's written. So when you go to look at a literature review, what you're looking for is big picture statistics, big picture statements of what the main gender issues are in the country, and then things basically that do map onto the domains. When you write your gender analysis, the written form of it, you can include the information that's most relevant to the areas where um, the mission plans to work. Hi, David from Georgia. <laughs> nice to see you, even electronically. Uh, his question is, can we use gender analysis and gender assessment interchangeably? Does the latter refer to the extent to which our internal systems or policies are gender sensitive? Yes, this is a good question. And uh, we were just talking back here in DC about this as a source of confusion for people in the field. So gender analysis and gender assessment don't mean the same thing. A gender analysis is what we've been talking about here, just the analytical questions where you try to get at the gender gaps and what you can do to close those gaps. A gender assessment does include components that look at our internal systems and how they're working and uh, the extent to which we're addressing gender via our systems. So when I did gender analyses in E&E, &E, I often did them in the form of assessments, which is why my gender analyses are called gender assessments from that region, because I looked not only at the gender gaps and needs for female empowerment in the countries, but I also looked at the missions. What were they doing to integrate gender? Were there gaps in mission processes that could also be addressed? But note that this piece is not mandatory. Some missions are interested and have been doing gender assessments. Gender audits are similar. But you're not required to do that. The analysis, the asking the questions about on the ground reality for men and women is the required bit. Here's a question from Naila in Pakistan. What about countries which do not have CDCSs? Um, Christina, I'm wondering if you might be interested in taking this one. Um, this is Christina Beck from the strategy team and PPL's Office of Strategic and Program Planning. Um, Kathy might be able to answer the question specifically about where gender analysis might be appropriate, but since it's come up a couple of times in the chat, um, missions that don't have CDCSs, just to acknowledge that is a situation that a few missions out there find themselves in. Um, Every mission has an integrated country strategy, and in some missions that don't have CDCSs, they do use the ICS as kind of their strategic organizing document for the mission. Uh, I just want to note that under the revised ADS 201 that we've been working on, the requirements for missions to write a CDCS have been a little bit more clearly defined. In the last round of the guidance, regional missions were allowed some discretion in which missions were going to do their CDCSs and when. In the new guidance, there are a couple of clear criteria for missions that are exempt from doing a CDCS. Those include missions that are working in non-presence countries and missions that are implementing single sector programming. Everybody else is going to be expected to do a CDCS unless they request a waiver, which is also a process outlined in the new guidance. Um, as for what level missions might consider doing a gender analysis in the absence of a CDCS, uh, I don't know what Kathy would say, but I will take a stab at it. I would imagine that it might be most useful to do it at the pad level, which some missions seem to be doing. But I am also aware that in some missions that don't have a CDCS, they do have a strategy. that It's not a CDCS and it's not an ICS, but there is a strategic plan for the mission. 
And I would say that in missions that have done that, it would still be useful to do a gender analysis at that strategy level, even if it's not a CDCS. Just because it's not a CDCS doesn't mean that you can't do kind of a strategy level gender analysis. Kathy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. <laughs> Sorry for technical difficulties again. Yes, that answer was perfectly accurate. That's exactly um, what we would encourage. OK, next question from Mahmouda. How can we ensure gender analysis at the PAD level? Um, how you can ensure, I'm not certain. I mean, ideally, your mission order on gender should include the processes by which the required gender analyses at the PAD level are going to be carried out. It is the responsibility, basically, of the high-level mission staff to ensure that these requirements are being met. There has also been a requirement to attach the gender analysis from the PAD level as an annex. And we also um, basically examined a series of PADs for gender integration as part of the gender assessment that I mentioned. And we did find that most missions attach them as annexes, but not all. So I think that also was a useful tool to ensure that the analyses were done. Um, we in DC honestly don't have eyes on whether missions are carrying out these analyses, so this is something that missions are, are going to need to take up internally and make sure um, that it happens. So here's a question. Um, for a gender analysis or assessment, are we expected to cover all five domains? Can we cover just two or three if we believe we have enough info for the, for the other domains? As I said earlier, it's not mandatory to cover all the domains. And the point is not to cover domains, but to use them to frame questions. I believe that in almost every country, all of those domains are going to be relevant. There may not, you know, there could be some unevenness. Some of them are more relevant than others. So you don't have to spend the same amount of time on every domain. But I urge you, at a minimum, to really think carefully about whether do, whether each of those domains are relevant. You know, I, I don't know any country where there are not gender stereotypes, for example, including ours. You know, here in the U.S. Um, so think through them. You know, the point's not to just tick them off, hopefully, but just to use those to frame the information that you want to collect. Mahmouda is asking if we have good gender sensitive indicators. The F indicators don't mean much for many missions. Yes, the F indicators are super big picture. Um, they are not in the weeds enough, really, for the purposes of most project tracking. And uh, we, the e and &E Bureau just produced, uh, two, a month or two ago, finally just completed a companion to the e, &E gender analysis toolkit that I mentioned which is an E&E &E toolkit of gender sensitive indicators. This is also now on ProgramNet. And it gives you sample gender sensitive indicators for all 16 of the sectors that were covered in the Companion Gender Analysis Toolkit. So that's a super useful resource. It doesn't matter what bureau you're in. Indicators are indicators. They're, they're not really specific to a region. There's a lot of other resources available on gender sensitive indicators. Um, we realize coming uh, looking at results in the assessment across the board that a lot of missions are struggling with exactly this issue. How do we design gender sensitive indicators? So I've been talking to my colleagues in LER about trying to come up with a few more resources for missions uh, exactly to this point. So hopefully in the near future, we'll have some more for you. OK, here's a question from Dylan in Peru, who says, social inclusion more broadly is a big focus at Embassy Lima. So this includes other groups, indigenous groups, LGBTI, et cetera. Do we have any guidance on whether to keep the CDCS gender analysis as a standalone analysis versus addressing some of these other marginalized groups? This is also a question that we get um, from a number of missions. So uh, the mandate is to do a gender analysis, but it doesn't say that you can't supplement that with also doing the same kind of analysis on other groups. So my answer to this question is that you must, at a minimum, cover gender, but you are certainly free to add an analysis. And you can, start, you can use the exact same tool. The gender analysis tool will allow you to look at the exclusions and challenges and obstacles that all these other groups face um, that you mentioned. So you can include those other groups in the same document. Uh, when I used to do these in E&E, for example, I always wrote a section on LGBTI. I always wrote a section on um, disabilities. Uh, focusing on women for the most part, since it was a gender analysis. But you can broaden that out. But you do need to make sure that you're still doing the due diligence um, with respect to gender while you do that. 
here's another question from um, Nayla. Is there any mission which has done baseline gender assessment and from the findings developed a gender action plan? You know, that's a good question. I'm not certain of the answer to that. And if there are any missions out there that have, we would love to hear about that. I think probably yes. I do know of a mission or two that required implementing partners to develop a gender analysis plan for every individual project. And they used the project or PAD level gender analyses to inform those. Whether this has happened at a CDCS level, I don't know. It's a good question. So if anyone is on the line has an answer to that, please let us know. And this is something uh, we might look at in the future, too. Um, Mahmoud is asking, how can you ensure gender analysis findings are rightly incorporated in the CDCS? Uh, again, I think this is really up to the mission to ensure that this happens. Uh, the best way, I think, is to use the template to go through the ADS, to look at all the things that we're saying need to be in the CDCS, work with the DO teams or whatever the structure is, basically, to work on the CDCS. Hopefully, this doesn't all fall on the gender advisor for the mission, who has usually a ton of work to do, but that there will be other technical folks uh, who can check this too. But again, I do want to say it is up to mission leadership to make sure that these requirements are being met. One, um, I guess, check on this, at least at the CDCS level, is if you send a CDCS to Washington that's gender blind so that the gender analysis findings are not incorporated, we're going to kick it back and flag that as a significant issue. Uh, so it saves you a lot of time, basically, uh, to do it thoroughly in the first place. Then here's a question. Which tools should one use to review project level gender analysis? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by review project level gender analysis. If you mean, do we have a checklist tool like the one I just showed you for CDCSs? We do have a similar tool for PADS, our project level gender analysis, but we're waiting to release that one for a little bit. We developed this again in conjunction with the gender assessment for the PAD uh, gender integration analyses that we were doing. And the reason I'm holding it back just briefly, we do want to make sure there were more changes with the, the PAD process in ADS-201. So we're waiting until that is cleared and released, and then we will update our PAD level gender analysis template and, and provide you with that either via another webinar like this or we'll just send it out around. So hopefully that's what uh, you were looking for there. Here's a question from the West Bank and Gaza. They don't have a CDCS, but they have one gender analysis covering all their portfolios. So can we use the template to reflect our gender integration in the absence of a CDCS? Sure. I think that um, you can use it basically to look at whatever, well, you're not, although I'm not clear, if you don't have a CDCS, you're, you're not saying sort of what you're using it for. How often should we do gender analysis? How long will it be valid? I'm not sure about the first question there exactly. If you don't, I mean, the purpose of the template really is to check whether the analysis is integrated into the CDCS. So Christina was mentioning earlier that sometimes there are other strategic documents. If you have something like that, then you can certainly use um, the checklist. But because this checklist is really pegged to the sections that are in a CDCS, it will probably be an imperfect fit to whatever your strategic document is. But the second part, how often should we do gender analysis? How long will it be valid? Um, we, this will be hashed out a little bit more in the upcoming CDCS guidance, but there will be some latitude, I think, in that guidance to update a, a gender analysis that was done for CDCS rather than doing a brand new one. We're still working on exactly the details or the rules by which that would be allowed to happen, so stay tuned for that. But most CDCS gender analyses are, you know, four or five years old. That's kind of getting, you know, that's getting up there. I think in most cases, almost all cases, you're going to have to double check your statistics at a minimum, update those, check whether country conditions have changed. Uh, I think it'd be very rare that you wouldn't have to do it, at least a pretty decent overhaul. But there'll be more information coming on this uh, a little bit further on. 
Then here's a question. Uh, what's the best way to do a gender analysis for a regional CDCS since that has to cover several countries? Yes, this is definitely harder. I think that the best strategy, you'll have to be even more 30,000 foot um, than you are when you're doing a one country CDCS because there's a lot of countries to cover um, when you're doing something regional. So the approach should basically be the same. Try to use the same questions. Try to get gather statistics as much as you can on a regional basis that highlights um, gender issues and gender differences. But I would say if you uncover country specific patterns or differences, you should also note those. Uh, so that when projects are being designed, if they focus on particular countries, uh, you have the info there. But we do realize it is harder to do at the regional level, uh, and it is a bigger challenge for you. Thanks so much, Kathy. Um, I also like to thank all the participants for joining us today and for all of your questions. Um, please feel free to stay on for a few minutes, because we do have some poll questions that we'd very much appreciate you answering if you have an opportunity to do so. And we will also be sending out a recording and transcript of, um, of this webinar today to the registered participants. Thank you again so much, and I hope the rest of your day is a good one.